Hi, everybody. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Jacob Burns. Uh, I missed a meeting, so that's why I'm the chapter president of the WB ASLA this year. Uh, they voted me in, so I'm doing that, and then I believe Grayson's going to take over next year. Uh, but we're really excited today to welcome Tori Carter Kneen, the CEO of ASLA National, as well as students from WBU. Uh, I think pretty much everybody here is a WBU grad. I could be wrong, but. Who's not? Anybody? Two? Okay. All right. Well, oh, me? I'm sorry. I'm not either. Yeah. <laughs> Go Cyclones. <laughs> Go Iowa State Cyclones. But as a chapter, we're excited to have students here. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to let Tori speak. Uh, after he speaks, just kind of to the group, he wanted a little bit of time to speak directly with the students. So those of us are professional practice, or practitioners going to just step out in the hallway. We wanted to have a quick chat with Professor Butler just as far as ways that uh, our professional practice can work with him and his extension appointment. So if everybody can give us a few minutes to have that conversation after Tori speaks. Uh, and then for students as well, you know, there are several firms represented here. If you're looking for jobs, I think this is mainly junior studio, yeah. correct? All juniors, yeah. It's all juniors, so, you know, you're a year or so away still from employment, but uh, certainly take some time to talk to everybody. Uh, internships, opportunities as well, I'm sure that there are firms here who could probably make that a reality for you all. So, I don't have anything else prepared. Uh, and and yeah. don't... Uh, leave until you go in, in the corner and pick up some swag. Yes, so that's something else I should mention. Today's luncheon was sponsored by Laura Cox, Laura Cox Planning and Design. <laughs> She's our past president of our chapter as well. Uh, I think probably almost everybody in the room has been the president <laughs> at some point in time, treasurer, secretary, uh, different things, different roles. Thank you all. But, uh, Without further ado, I'll let you get started. <laughs> All right. Thanks. Good morning, everybody. Right? Good morning. Oh, nope. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. <laughs> um, it's really exciting to be here. Thanks for coming out. It's a really good group. I'm really happy to see the students. Professionals well are great, too. Um, but these are the future practitioners. Um, so I'm really happy to be here. I think we tried to do this last year. I tried to come to West Virginia, but I can't remember what happened. Um, but it didn't work out, so we were committed to making it happen this year. So I'm really, I'm really thrilled to be here. So today I'm going to talk to you a little bit about um, a couple things. Well, the climate action plan is the main thing that we're talking about uh, this year on this sort of road trip that I'm on. We revealed the climate action plan um, at the conference in San Francisco. How many of you were in San Francisco? You. Good. Thank you. So many of you, this will be new. That's great. You could actually give this presentation from <laughs> Um, but I'll tell you a little bit about that, then I'll talk to you about some of the programs, uh, the other programs that ASLA is working on uh, over the next year. And we'll talk a little bit about our strategic plan uh, for the next several years, and then we'll talk a little bit about resources for students. Um, and then we can follow up and, with any questions and more conversation about that when we have our little one time without, without them. Uh, Y'all gotta wake up a little bit. I know you just ate. <laughs> Come on. I want to get that nerve ball machine. Um, <laughs> All right, so let's dive right into the Climate Action Plan. So first, before we talk about the Climate Action Plan uh, that was produced over the last year, it's important to talk about how we got to the point of needing a plan or creating it. Uh, and so we give you a little bit of history. Actually, I'm going to pause, stop, 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 stop. Watch the video, please. As we increasingly experience the impact of the climate exactly. and biodiversity crisis, we know we need to act faster. Landscape architects are the only design professionals who bring all the pieces together to plan and design what communities need to prepare themselves for a changing world. In 2021, the International Federation of Landscape Architects, or the IFLA, Climate Action Commitment was presented at the United Nations COP26 conference in Glasgow, Scotland. The American Society of Landscape Architects, or ASLA, along with over 70,000 landscape architects around the world from 77 nations, signed on to the EFLA commitment pledging to take greater climate action. To move this forward, ASLA created a climate action plan with the goal of helping landscape architects and organizations achieve zero emissions for projects and business operations, and to double carbon sequestration as a profession by 2040. 
The ASLA Climate Action Plan is rooted in three key goals and six key initiatives of the EFLOC Climate Action Commitment with a total of 21 objectives and 71 actions. The plan will guide the development of policies and programs to reach the vision by 2040 and outlines ambitious goals and actions that will be taken now and through 2025. To ensure the plan's effectiveness, ASLA will be measuring the progress and involving all members of the broader landscape architecture community. These goals and actions will be revisited and updated in 2025 and every five years until 2040. The plan also comes with a climate action field guide for ASLA members. It provides best practice guidance, toolkits, and resources for individuals, firms, and organizations to become better climate advocates. The three key goals outlined in both documents are practice, equity, and advocacy. Each goal focuses on two initiatives to advance the long-term vision. Practice Attain zero emissions by 2040 and double carbon sequestration. Enhance capacity, biodiversity, and resilience of livable cities and communities. Equity. Advocate for climate justice and social well-being. Learn from cultural knowledge systems and practices of care. Advocacy. Galvanize climate champions. Advance the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals and expand international collaboration. ASLA is taking a step forward by providing resources to landscape architects and communities on how to plan and design climate positive solutions that increase carbon sequestration and address climate risks. For more information, visit www.asla.org forward slash climate to view the action plan and field guide. ASLA members can reach out to their nearest chapter to get involved. All right, so that, what that video was, was, as I mentioned, we unveiled this plan in uh, San Francisco. And Todd, you know this, you were there, right? That there was an enormous buzz throughout the conference. We had about 6,200 people at the conference in San Francisco, which was one of our high, highest attended conferences ever. Uh, and we revealed this in the general session, um, part of the presentation you're going to see. And throughout the conference, it was really exciting for me just to hear, you know, pockets of people gathered around, uh, beginning to actually talk about the plan because we delivered it to all of our members' inboxes immediately after it was revealed. And there was a, this incredible energy and excitement about it that people were already sort of combing through. And actually, saw somebody who printed it already, which was kind of impressive. Uh, um, and from that unveiling, one of our member organizations contacted us and put together this video. Right? They were so excited about it that they wanted to put together a video for us. And so I've been using that to sort of frame up and introduce the plan to people to really kind of give them a you know, 90 second version of what was actually in the plan. But let's sort of, so that's, that's today, right? But let's sort of take a few years back to talk about how we got to this point. Uh, because this work didn't just start a couple of years ago. Uh, you hear climate action, you, and you hear um, uh, the sort of sense of urgency. The new IPCC report came out a couple of days ago that makes it even more urgent for us all to act and do our parts. But the truth is, landscape architects and, and this organization and the broader community have been working on these issues, and sustainability issues, for since since 1899, frankly, right when the organization was established. So, but back in 2009. You know, so this, this chart kind of represents our journey, right? It started with the Sites uh, um, Initiative project back in, back in 2009. Uh, that members came together and put together uh, this first white paper on climate action that, that, that uh, members could be doing. And it progressed all the way through all of these different activities that you're seeing. Blue Ribbon Panel in 2016 on climate change and resilience. Student members actually, this was right before I started in 2018. It was, I started in 2020. Uh, as CEO, one of the first things I heard when I came on board was that we had this uh, uh, call to action. I don't know what just happened. But I'll keep talking. So we had this call to action from students that ASLA wasn't doing enough on climate. And, and there it is. It's really sensitive here. Uh, so, 
There was a call to action. They actually created a website that was ASLA adapted. And it had all of these lists of things that, that students were demanding of ASLA. Because the truth of the matter is, as an organization, we were not, we didn't have both feet fully into the climate action space. Uh, because the truth of the matter is, you know, we have, our, our membership is broad and diverse, and there are some members who are leaning forward into this work, and some, some members aren't as, 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 as active in this space, right? But I, personally, I think that there is not only a health, safety, and public welfare uh, component to this work, there's also an enormous amount of jobs and, and actually economic benefit that can come from landscape architects from doing this work. And we are the ones who are most uh, appropriately educated and equipped to actually make this happen and lead these projects. So I think that there are many, many co-benefits to this work beyond, in addition to the health benefits and saving the planet, there's also an economic and business benefit for firms uh, and solo practitioners who want to who do this work. Do good by doing, do well by doing good is what we say. So this is the Blue Ribbon Panel. The next few slides basically go through each one of these activities that we did over the last decade to get us to this point. Again, ASLA members, student, student members adapt. And then in 2020, after that, that, that student push happened in 2020, and then in 2020, I'm sorry, 2018, and then in 2020, we created our first climate action committee of members. So ASLA has probably several dozen committees that work on different different issues for the organization, volunteer leaders, volunteer driven. And the Climate Action Committee was created in 2020. And one of the things they first started talking about was this need for a climate action plan. And it was they were they were put together right right before I started. So I, again I started in August. Um, but I wanted the plan to be anchored in our strategy. You'll hear a little bit more about that uh, in the next few slides. Oh I have to tell you. We're having a rough time here. You need to, I'll go up and click for you if you need Oh, that's to. nice, but that, I want you to feel that this is great. Can you see this way? Anyway, we'll keep going. Um, which means you're going to have to look at me. Huh? Did it move? Yeah. That means you're going to have to look at me more. Sorry, pause right there. Pull the, uh, pull the, the video cord out and plug it back in. Oh, that's good. Oh, Roger. Well, shoot. <laughs> 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 Restart it. Wait, you still see the mouse moving, so I don't Yeah, it's weird, right? This whole way around the shape. Oh, wait a minute. What did I just do? All right, here we go. Yay! That's all I get. You know what I just did? All right, it woke up. I'm going to stay in close, though. Um, so back to this. So this is so all of this is the progressive steps that we've taken over the years to get to an actual climate action plan. So again, this is IFLA, the International Federation of Landscape Architects. ASLA and IFLA represents 77 organizations like ASLA across the country, across the world. So every country has an organization of those 77 countries. They have an organization like ASLA that has members that are part of those organizations that collectively uh, represent about 77,000 landscape architects around the world. Um, we are the largest, I like saying that, <laughs> um, of the, of the uh, members of the Federation. Um, but it's really, really important because climate has no border. Uh, so it's important for us to be collaborating together um, to solve these issues. And most importantly, it's really interesting to learn how practice is different around the world in different regions um, than here in the States. Um, even we even had conversations. This is a little off script. We even had conversations at our last conference about the language that the people use to describe professions different around the world, and so and translating landscape architecture in different languages is difficult, which makes it even more complicated for people to understand what the profession is when you're trying to explain it to people, which is something that none of you have ever experienced, I'm sure, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, 
COP26. So COP is the, the Council of Parties. It is the, um, the UN's, basically, group that comes together and all the government agencies um, and NGOs like ASLA um, come together to talk about climate policy um, and implementation around the world. So all the commitments that you hear about that sometimes don't make a lot of sense, um, that aren't clear, the 1.5 degrees, um, what that means sort of in practice and what you can do in your day-to-day -day work. Um, these agencies come together to talk about that and, and commit to what they're gonna do in their government, in their different countries to draw down carbon. We are a member of that now uh, because ASLA is now what is called an NGO observer, which means that we are now in those conversations with those government agencies across the, uh, across the uh, world advocating for landscape architecture and landscape arch and climate positive design solutions at those tables in those conversations, which is really, really important for us as an organization. Um, and the, the great thing is they want the American Society of Landscape Architects to be at those tables, uh, and now we will be. So this is just a picture of uh, COP27. While I was in San Francisco unveiling the Climate Action Plan, uh, that's Pamela Conrad, uh, who helped author the Climate Action Plan, we sent her to Egypt to represent ASLA uh, at COP for the first time as an NGO observer in the room advocating for landscape architects. Really exciting stuff. So let's continue the story, right? So we didn't just sort of take all of those things we were doing for the last 10 years and the students pushing us to move forward and all of the, the sort of blue ribbon panels and all that work that happened previously. That's great. And we, we know in our, in our internally within the organization that this is something that we needed to do. But it's always good to ask your members, right? It's always good to ask them what they need so that you actually produce the product that is useful to them. And so we did. We did a mini survey of our membership, and we had 563 members who responded. And this is what they, they said they needed and why. So they wanted to, they needed the, the plan to provide insights on the demand for planning and designing solutions to climate change. And they, they wanted us to help explain to clients Give them the tools to explain to client, clients who have questions about the concern, who have concerns about climate action and climate impact. So they wanted language. How do I talk about this? How do I talk about the co benefits of this design and this plan? Not just from a design and accessibility perspective, but also from a climate impact perspective. And the resilience perspective. 65% of the members uh, have recommended the integration of climate solutions to all or most of their clients. So they're starting to make progress in, in convincing clients that this is important and should be part of their work, part of their design uh, solutions. Nearly half have construction value, apropos of this meeting right now, half have construction value over a million dollars. And climate projects, 10 of, and, and several of them had climate projects that created more than 10 jobs per project. I'm sorry. That's important. I always go back to that slide because that's really important. That's just the beginning. That's the point, is that there's an, there's an economic need for our membership, for our members, to do this work. Uh, and it's an incredible opportunity for the profession to step forward and step into the space to lead projects that only, frankly, landscape architects should be leading. Um, out of full respect to our engineers and our architects, landscape architects are really uniquely qualified to do this work. Um, I'm just, <laughs> uh, do you, you hear that? Yeah. It's important. It's really important. It's really, it's important. really, it really important. is. Um, that's just the plan itself. So, the other thing that was really important about when we created this plan was that we didn't want to outsource this to anybody else. It was important that it be created and written for and by landscape architects. So, this slide represents the diversity of the profession. Practice type. Educators are in here, um, young professionals, emerging professionals are in here, big commercial projects, small, smaller firms, it's geographically diverse. Uh, these, they, these, are the, these are the cream of the crop uh, for folks who would be doing and putting together the plan for the organization and the profession to lead in this work. Really proud of that, that team. And I should also add that we collaborated with some of our international partners. So the, um, Australian Institute of Landscape Architecture. They were we were in conversation about you know how our plans could be complementary. 
Uh, and so again, not just sort of thinking about this uh, only from our perspective, but how can we partner with other organizations who are trying to do some of the same things. The, th the plan had three, you'll hear more about this later, um, but you know, there were three things that you know, sort of the, 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 the task force or the advisory group kind of came through really quickly, came through really quickly as some goals. Um, equity, nature, and zero emissions growth. Felt like that sort of captured all of the sort of big sort of 30,000 foot goals for the plan. Was that it had to sort of, it had to speak to these three issues. Now, what is that vision for 24? Because it's already 2023. What are some of the things we want to get done by 2040? Now keep in mind, as you saw earlier, every five years we're going to look at this. So this is more of a living document um, because it's imperfect. Uh, it, it is, is it audacious. It's ambitious. Uh, it's going to take a lot of work, but we're going to have to keep going to it as we learn more about how we're doing as, as the, the, the crisis adjusts. Again, we had a new report a couple days ago that tells us that this is ambitious, but maybe not, might not even be enough, right? Uh, as, as, uh, to meet the needs or the, to meet the challenge that's ahead of us. But this is where we're starting. The goal is for all landscape architecture projects to simultaneously achieve zero embodied, and, and embodied is the important part, embodied in operational emissions and increase carbon sequestration. Now the truth is a lot of our projects in the design work that you're doing do this, but we need even more of it. Next, provide significant economic benefits in the form of measurable ecosystems, services, health code benefits and green jobs. This is what I was speaking to earlier about the way we can talk about this to municipalities, decision makers, people who are making decisions about funding projects, is to talk about the co-benefits of this work. Um, because as you know, elected officials want to know, you know, how is this going to work for me and my community? Not just from, I mean, it's important. All of these are equally important, but they also want to know how is it going to create jobs? How is it going to help solve what are the benefits? How is it going to create and reconnect communities? Right? These are things that when decision makers and policy makers are deciding where funding goes, these are a lot of the object objectives that they're, and questions that they're asking around the table. Does your project do this? I was at, I met with the, the mayor's office in Boston a couple of weeks ago, and these were the things that they were asking of us in the room. How does, how does it, the plan's great, fantastic, we love it, but how does it do this? Address climate injustices and empower communities and increase equitable distribution of climate investments. This is huge too, because there are a lot of, there's, there's a lot of history in our country of highways dividing communities, um, and one side of the community getting a lot of investment, the other side of the community not getting a lot of investment. And so uh, I was in Cornell a couple, two weeks ago, a week ago, it's a lot of travel. Uh, and one of the things they're doing is sort of rerouting a highway that was that split right down the middle of a, of a community, and again, one community was divested in, and the other other part of it has much more accessibility, access to public space, um, and they're going to take that highway and re reroute it around the community and reconnect those two communities together so that they can come together. Really important: health, safety, public welfare. Did you know that public welfare was in the original charter of this organization? The original charter uh, of um, the three founders was to protect and promote the public welfare. That's exactly what this is. This is home for us. This is what we do. Restore ecosystems and protect, conserve, and enhance biodiversity. And this is something that, you know, if, if we've spent a lot of time over the last decade, decade really talking about climate action. Biodiversity is, is not new for many of our practitioners, but sort of incorporating this and coupling it with climate action is something that we're now doing and leaning much more further into because if you can actually solve some of the biodiversity crisis, you then can also help climate action. So, you heard this earlier in the video. These are the three goals. Practice, equity, and advocacy. Those are the, the, the entire plan is anchored under these three objectives. So let's talk about what that means. Scale up positive, climate positive design. So part of what we have to do is educate our members more. It's part of why I'm here. It's part of why I'm going around the country talking to people about the plan and inviting them to read it and use it in their work and in their projects. In Denver, uh, in January, I went and uh, I met with the firm Dig, 
uh, and they had the, they they had copies of the plan out, and they literally had markups, right, tabs and things, where they actually sat with clients and sat amongst each other and talked about how they can deploy some of the tools, particularly in the field guide that we we'll talked about in a few minutes. So I guess the point of it is that, is that it's not just a plan you put on the shelf that we put on the shelf and it's great, it's got all these great aspirational goals, but it's supposed to be practical and useful. Equity, we talked about this again, empowering communities. So it's important for communities to understand how this kind of work can impact their day-to-day -day lives. They have to understand that in order to get by it. Um, it's important for policymakers to understand how this can help empower communities. Um, so that's a huge part of the component of the work. The last piece is advocacy. Again, I mentioned being in, in Boston, meeting with um, the, the mayor's office. We have to have these partnerships, right? Um, I mean, we also have to have these partnerships to defend licensure, which is also really, really important. Um, but when you have those relationships, you can also go to them and talk about advocacy, um, not just for the profession, but for this kind of, um, these kind of climate positive design solutions. And most municipalities are asking for it. Again, as I said, they want to know how, how they can incorporate these things into the projects and community uh, planning that they're doing. So again, landscape architecture are like right, perfectly suited and position to lead this work. Y'all are going to have a lot of work. You too. You're going to have a lot of work. Um, so this is the field guide. The most important thing to, the, to me when we started this project was that, again, it'd be useful. I, we were not going to put out a plan that was just aspirational with a bunch of goals um, that nobody read. If you actually go and download this field guide, which is going to be the last thing we tell you uh, in this presentation, you will see dozens of resources and tools that you can actually go to and use in your practice now um, to learn more about what this all means, how you can start to take steps, how you can begin to identify products um, to incorporate into your plan that actually does reduce emissions. All of those things are in the actual field guide. It's thick, I'll tell you. You print it, God bless you. Um, but it's, and these are all the things. So these are, these are not all the things. There are many of the elements, the, the, the tools and resources that are actually embedded uh, in the plan. There's also a link to a tool called Pathfinder, where you can actually put in some of the um, uh, needs of your project, and it will push out how, if you use this product or these types of materials, it will reduce uh, your carbon footprint overall for the project. Like practical things that you can use in your practice. Really, really key, really, really important. So as I said, this is the this is the ask. It's not heavy lift, right? It's free to <laughs> read the plan, download that field guide. I promise you it'll be useful. Uh, and I would love for Jacob, if you organize some sort of conversation at the chapter level about the plan. The most important thing that you can do for us is to give us feedback what you're reading. Uh, when I was at Cornell, uh, I did a lecture with faculty and um, students, and one of the faculty members, actually was a landscape architect on, on the Cornell staff, uh, he said, you know, we should take our sustainability, Cornell's sustainability plan, and overlay it with ASLA's climate action plan, and see where we can learn from each other and give you feedback on our plan and incorporate some of the things you're planning into ours. That's exactly what we want to have. So I invite you all in the room like this, my students, uh, and dig into it. And then tell us what, what's missing, tell us what you think about it, tell us if you're like, I still, I, still don't, I still don't know where to start. We need that feedback so we can actually put together educational resources and incorporate these kinds of um, uh, learnings into the conference programming, into our virtual learning, and things like that, so we can keep this thing moving and keep it alive and give you what you need in order to, to actually incorporate these kinds of climate positive design solutions into your work. All right, so that's the climate action plan. You can clap. <laughs> yeah, hard shift, right? Climate positive and climate uh, action Huge part of what we're doing, huge part of uh, the organization's work for years to come. Been a part of the organization's work for decades.
but it's rooted in this. So what you're seeing here, who was in Nashville at the conference? Todd, uh, where are you? <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Nobody was in Nashville. All right. So in Nashville, I unveiled our 2030 vision for the organization, where we're going in the next 10 years. Seven at this point. Uh, and the first three-year bite of that work is our current strategic plan that we're operating under right now. But this visual presentation, this was presented and sketched out on the screen for all of our members at the general session. And this paints a picture of the kind of organization we want to be in the next 10 years. So, um, and you know, we can get you a copy of this. You can actually go watch the video on ASLA.org. Um, I actually encourage you to because it tells a story of the history of the profession. It talks about, I mean, I talk about Garrett Ekbo, I talk about Olmstead, I talk about a lot of the people that you probably talk about um, um, in your uh, program. And, and basically, you know, sort of bring us to today, right? Because all of those lessons and all of that amazing design work and being good stewards of the earth and all of that is exactly an evolution of what we're doing. It's the same thing. It's in our roots, it's in our DNA. We use different language perhaps, but it's the same kind of work. We're designing solutions to connect communities and promote the public health and safety and welfare. It's the same thing. For 100 plus years. But this is our vision. Service, purpose, climate action. We're going to do it together. People. You know, this is something that um, Olmsted, one of my favorite things that he would say, is that the art is to conceal art. And one of his design principles uh, was subordination. And he believed in the big reveal of a project. Uh, I've kind of geeked out on that to architecture since I've taken this job a little bit. Um, but it's really fascinating once you learn more about, you all know this, right? Once you learn more about the profession and the history of it, and then you sort of look at things with a second eye, you appreciate it in, in a completely different way once you have that understanding that it was so intentionally designed that way. And speaking of intentionality, <laughs> I need to intentionally stand over here. The art is the to hide the art. Right. <laughs> oh, somebody was listening. I like it. All right, well, hold on. Okay, so the five pillars of the plan, though, are community, connection, scale, voice, and innovation. Um, and we use these five anchors to create everything that we're doing in 2022, this year, and next year. So the Climate Action Plan, you can see, is one of the things that we said we're going to do as part of our strategy for the organization. And what's really cool, I will say, about, it's, I always say it's a great time to be a landscape architect, and it's a really great time to lead this organization. So I have a fun job. Uh, and there's nothing better than when a member comes up to me and says, hey, now, I mean, it's good, it's also kind of scary. When they come up to me and say, hey, I want you to do this thing. Brilliant idea, right? I want you to do this thing. And I'm like, uh, well, no, it's not quite in our plan to do that. But we'll, you know, as we do our next plan, we'll think about it. And I said, well, yeah, I know. That's, I'm asking you because I see that you put your climate action plan in your strategy, and then you actually did it. So if I can get you to get something in your strategic plan, I know you're going to do it. There's nothing more gratifying than members knowing that when you say you're going to do something for them, and you actually do it, that's a great way to keep members. It's a great way to, to get members fully and deeply connected to the organization because there's accountability, and they trust you. It's huge. You trust us, hopefully. All right, I'm preaching to the choir, I hope. So, again, we're doing a quick pivot, right? So we did a lot of conversation on climate action. Now, here are some of the other things we're doing at the organization. The Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act. So I mentioned that y'all were going to be busy, because one of the things that we worked on at ASLA was working with the administration on, I think, 13 of our recommendations as an organization that we sent over to the Biden administration when they first took office, so we pulled them up this big, all the things that we wanted them to do. And when, the, when this Infrastructure and Jobs Act passed, we were like, it's like Christmas for landscape architects. Because it is full of funding for projects across the country that landscape architects are going to be able to take advantage of and lead. I mean, so work is going to be a plenty. And it's really good that I hear as I go around the country from our members that they're like, oh my god, I'm so, so busy. And the next problem I have to solve for is getting more of you into programs so that you can then do the work that's coming. This is a decade of funding, basically, that's going to come 
coming out the pipeline. And then if you couple this, maybe the next slide, you couple that, the, the Jobs Act with the in Inflation Reduction Act, and it's just, I mean, bountiful resources are gonna be poured into um, states and local municipalities to do public funding project work. And landscape architects are, are gonna be taking full advantage of that. So one of the things we're gonna do is teach you how to access those resources. Um, in addition to that, we're starting to be more, in addition to the COP I told you about, trying to be more uh, involved internationally, we're also, we've been invited twice now to, to participate in The Economist Global uh, Weekly Sustainability Conference. Um, I was on a panel last year with AIA and USGBCI, and this year I'm gonna moderate the panel. Um, and again, it's getting landscape architects and getting more and more people familiar with the profession and understanding the capabilities that landscape architects can do for them, uh, leading projects. So the economist place, we're promoting expertise in public forums. We have a regular ongoing relationship now with Fast Company um, to again raise awareness for the profession and talk to a different business group who may be hiring landscape architects. Um, developers lead, read Fast Company. There are all kinds of business leaders who read Fast Company that we're trying to tap into and get them aware and recognizing landscape architecture as a profession that they may need to uh, hire and reach out to and partner with on projects. This is one of the, the programs that we've recently launched as part of our practice management institute. It's called Skilled Ed. Some people just say skilled. We like to be cute and say skilled ed. Uh, but basically the idea is there is a student, oh, we, we heard from a lot of our emerging professionals that you know, they come out of college, they finish their program, and they go to a firm and there's a little bit of a gap of how do you, how does firm life work? And so, and, and, and why is the contract written this way? Why is the proposal written this way? How does marketing work? All of these components, how, how do I, how does, why is the contract sort of, sort of set up this way? You know, why, why is the principal focusing on this thing or another? Well, this whole program is designed to help emerging professionals understand the mechanics and the business side of working at a firm. So it has been one of the tracks was marketing. Again, contracts writing, um, financing, uh, human resources. It's, it's sort of trying to sort of have young professionals a little bit more prepared for firm life. Because oftentimes I hear from young professionals that they want to they start their own firm. Well, you have to be able to do these sort of fundamental core things if you want to do that. So that's what this program was designed to do. STEM. Quickly touch on this because we are waiting with bated breath. So believe it or not, landscape architecture, according to the Department of Homeland Security, is not the STEM profession. Uh, I know, sir. I know. I put my head down too. Yep. Um, what's your name, sir? Yes, from I work for U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, and we didn't agree with that. Yeah. We don't either. <laughs> so, what we're fighting for uh, as an organization. So last year we applied, we, we put together a package, uh, submitted it to DHS. We got word back that we did not get approved as a STEM profession. Um, it was odd the people they, the, or the types of professions they did choose, um, but we were not chosen. But we weren't done. So I reached out to we, the organization, and me personally because I, I come from the American Immigration Lawyers Association, and actually this this whole issue of STEM, it's DHS and it's an immigration related issue. It's, we'll talk later about why that is, um, but it is. So I reached out to my contacts. We've had conversations with the White House to advocate for us to be a STEM profession. We put together a new package of information, worked with educators and different programs to get, they wanted us to have patents, they wanted us to focus on innovation, they wanted us to focus on the science part of the profession, uh, and we did. We put together a beautiful, amazing white paper full of case studies and examples of why landscape architecture is a STEM profession, and we're just waiting to hear back from them. Last, last year, it was, it was, the decision was made in late January, uh, and the, I actually got an update yesterday. It's still, it's still gobbled up in the, you can imagine what the bureaucratic mess looks like in my hometown of DC, uh, but it's, it's, it's not a no. Um, it could be a yes, we just have to wait and see. If it's not a yes this time, we'll go. 
back to the wheelhouse and keep fighting for it until we get it because we believe it's obvious to us. And frankly, what I'll say is when I talk to folks who are in that space, that sort of um, uh, agency in, in DHS or otherwise, when we talk about the profession with them, they go, oh yeah, that makes perfect sense. Right? Yes, of course, everything you're saying makes perfect sense. You are a center profession. And yet still, um, we, we still fight the same battle. But hopefully, if you invite me back, I'll be able to come back and tell you that we've actually achieved it. We've actually changed our CAP code to sustainability studies because it's STEM mm -hmm. and to get grad students to come over. It's yep. so important. It's really important. So we One of the first it. questions you get, right? Yep, yeah, absolutely. But yeah. So it is a STEM it's really degree important. for us. And it's terrible that you have to do that. I know. It's so rough. It's been like that for so long. So. Mm -hmm. I'm definitely, I'm, yeah, I'm a little in my feelings about doing yeah. that. So. Uh, hopefully, again, I'll be able to come back and tell you that we got it. Uh, this is just a photo from the International Federation of Landscape Architects Conference that we went to last year. It was in Guangzhou, South Korea. This year, I've been asked to keynote in Nairobi, Kenya. So again, representing ASLA and American landscape architects around the world, really, really important. Um, because they are, they are really interested in learning about how we practice here and how they can apply some of the leading uh, innovative work that we're doing here around the world. I'm really excited to represent us uh, in September. This, I heard someone say, you mentioned K through 12 work that you do. This is a pro pro one of my favorite programs that we have. We started a couple of years ago. It's called Dream Big with Design. And the whole basis of the program is to introduce landscape architecture to young people at an early age, knowing that if we do, they get excited about it, and then maybe they're in this room like you all, studying for the program and then sitting in the room like you all, practicing uh, in the profession. So last year, we, we now did it two years in a row. The first year, both have been virtual. Um, we incorporated Minecraft. Who knows what Minecraft is? All right. <laughs> Usually, it's this crapshoot if I get people who know it. I mean, if it's not a younger demographic, um, don't take a mess. <laughs> um, but we use Minecraft. Uh, to talk about landscape architecture with students and they eat it up. And so this year will be the third year of this program. We're actually trying to scale up this program significantly by partnering with Discovery because they have a program where they're already inside of curriculums in programs around the country. So we're trying to raise funds to actually partner with them so that we can basically infuse landscape architecture automatically in programs around the country. This is really, really important. And again, the payoff is you get more and more young people excited about it, when you become a profession, when you become part of this profession. Because when you hear about it, the thing is, and we'll talk about this later, I usually hear from students, I always ask the question, how did you, how did you deter, determine that you wanted to be a landscape architect? And usually I hear a handful of the same answers. I started off as an architect, and then my roommate was a, land, had, was a landscape architecture major. I came across a book, and I fell in love with it. I've had somebody even sort of Google the like three things that they care about, like sustainability, environment, design, and landscape architecture pops up. And they're like, oh my god, I had no idea this was a profession. Um, so people are, a lot of young people don't know about it when they get to college, and it's sort of their second choice once they didn't learn about it. Uh, we got to change that. We really have to, we really have to change that. But that's the exciting program. So if you want to know more about that, I encourage you to go to ASLA.org. And you know, one of the things that Lisa Jennings, who leads their program, is doing is she does work with chapters to try to get more practitioners into schools. While we try to scale this up, um, in the meantime, she does try to work with chapters um, to create opportunities to go into schools for career day or otherwise, to just have a conversation, for practitioners to have a conversation with young people to introduce the profession to them. It's really cool. We're almost done, folks. This is another extension of a, a program that was launched a couple of years ago uh, because we did some research. Uh, we were part of an alliance of professionals to defend licensure. And one of the things that, and they did some research for us, one of the things they realized is licensure, there are multiple benefits of lots of licensure. One of them is that it's a paid advisor uh, for women and people of color. And so, but there are not nearly enough of these people practicing in landscape architecture. And there are challenges that they face 
to license her that we wanted to help support or, or help them with. And actually, this whole program was, was born out of two, two members, two executive committee members of mine, who came to me and said, we want to do something, we want to help, and we're willing to give you money to pay for it, which is really important. Uh, and so out of that, we created this program. And this program provides 10 uh, landscape architects, oh, 10 um, um, folks who want to be licensed to become uh, licensed landscape architects, um, full ride. We pay for the, all parts of the exam, we provide them with a mentor, we give them study materials, and we give them up to two years to pass, pass all four parts. Uh, so we take the, the financial burden and give them a lot of support to study to help them become licensed. Really, really exciting. We had our first cohort last year, 10 or 12, I think, and I think we're going to have another dozen this year. If you want to learn more about that, ASLA.org as well. This is another cool thing that happened last year, is that now all of our professional award winners are going to be archived in the Library of Congress. The architects have been there, and now the landscape architects are also going to be there. So any award winner, any of our professional awards, you go to the Library of Congress, and there's going to be a landscape architecture um, uh, award winners featured there. Really, really cool. This is y'all, right? You're the future. Um, this. It, this image is from the conference, uh, but basically, this next set of slides is about the opportunities that we provide for students. Job link, kind of important. You know, I, I know the question is going to be, you know, how do I get a job? You know, um, link, uh, the skill ed program helps you learn how to interview, practical skills about interviewing and things like that. But job link is on ASLA.org. Tons of jobs across the country from firms uh, posting and needing. Really good talent. So go here, go here, not you. <laughs> Maybe sometime. Maybe. <laughs> you want to make an announcement? No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> um, this is a huge resource that I encourage you to take advantage of uh, as you start to look for uh, uh, jobs as you graduate. LARE Prep. Again, there's a whole program separate and apart from the Women of Color License Advancement Program. There is, we have tools and resources, and we actually do a prep study session at the conference specifically for preparing you to take the LRA LR exam and pass it. Uh, so lots of resources available for you uh, to become licensed. And obviously, the student awards. Uh, we talked about the professional awards being in the Library of Congress, but I would also encourage students to submit. You know, take a look at ASLA.org again, and I encourage you to submit for the student awards. It's really, really special. This moment here on stage is one of the highlights of the conference when you see students go up uh, and, and be recognized for their great work uh, every year at the conference. It's really, really cool. I encourage you to take a look and, and consider it. And this, um, at our last conference in San Francisco, we had 900 students attend, all free. So go to the conference. You can afford it. <laughs> We, we sent two last year. You sent two? Yeah. Let's double it next year. Full scholarship, and they volunteered, so it was a free conference. Yeah. It was amazing. Yeah. So we'll send more next year. It's a really, it's a really, and I will tell you, you add an element to the conference that is much needed. Uh, it's really, really exciting, and the practitioners love it. And that was one of, besides the, besides the climate action plan, the other comment I got was, oh my god, there's so many students, this is great. And we do a fun tailgate uh, uh, celebration at the expo floor where all of the different schools sort of, you know, I did a Texas A&M chant twice now every year. It's really, really fun. It's a good time. You should come. And it's a really good time to sort of network and see it and see some of your, uh, it's, it's rich with employment opportunities, let me tell you. Um, so please join us. I don't know who that is. Uh, that's it. You made it. Thank you, thank you, thank you. So what do we, what's, do we have students now, or? Yeah, so that's the general idea. Okay. Uh, if you want to go ahead and break out into that, is that okay with our professional practitioners? Yeah. I had enough? <laughs> <laughs>